Welcome to the Converge Podcast. This is a ministry of Village Church. My name is Steve. My name is Nate. And we're here to talk about the convergence of mission and doctrine to inform you how to have a Christian worldview in a non-Christian world. If you like the podcast today, do us a favor. Give us a five-star review. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button over on podcasts. And also, if you're on YouTube, hit that thumbs up icon and also subscribe to this channel as well. If you really like the podcast, tell some friends, send the link out, and get some people listening to this. Welcome. Random pictures. Again, welcome to the Converge podcast. Now, in our last episode, we mentioned that it's important for the local church to gather. That is kind of historically speaking, been a norm. And the reason it's a norm for the church is because it is a biblical ideal that's spelled out really throughout the whole scripture. The people of God in the Old Testament would gather corporately. And then again, they continued that in the New Testament. But we didn't spend a lot of time kind of biblically, theologically Mm -hmm. uh, breaking this subject down. So on this episode, what we want to do is spend some more time talking about why the publicly gathered church matters today, even in light of everything that we see going on in the world, in light of everything that we have technologically, where where the kind of capability of having a quote-unquote online Mm -hmm. church is concerned. Uh, Gathering physically with the local church, not just in homes, but also in church buildings, you know, Mm -hmm. what we could call... I think, a sacred space, why that still matters. Uh, and I, I think COVID mm-hmm. has really raised some of these questions. Yep. Um, as, as people have reacted to COVID and as churches reacted to COVID uh, and shutting down whether or not it was for a few weeks, uh, whether or not it was for a few months, we have some churches, you know, six months later that are still uh, not meeting. Some churches have publicly said we are not going to meet until 2021. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do on January 1st when maybe oh, no. things haven't really. Right. Uh, the <laughs> landscape isn't that much different where public perception is concerned. And so we want to talk about some of the questions that COVID has answered. What are some of those questions from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this did come up from COVID. And so even in the last episode, I think you made a really good point is um, we have observed some churches are are ringing some bells that are pretty hard to unring. Mm -hmm. And so I think how this kind of started is, you know, a lot of churches shut down for good reasons. We don't need to rehash that. But then at a certain point, the church starts to ask itself, okay, we need to worship. But then some people start asking the question, well, why? Why is it vital for us to worship? I even saw a lot of comments kind of in the internet social sphere of, well, churches need to worship because they need money. Yeah. <laughs> like some crass thing. And yeah. I'll tell you, that's not true at all because actually any pastor knows online giving is actually better. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, that's a whole different discussion to have. Yeah. But, you know, there was just some kind of crass cynical reasons of, oh, churches need to worship because pastors want to see people in the building. And none of that's true. But I think what we really need to start answering is what is a theological reason for why public corporate gathered worship is essential and important because a lot of the uh, feedback and a lot of the observation we're seeing from some of these churches that are saying we're not going to gather publicly until next year. I've seen some say until there's a vaccine Mm. um, is okay. Well, why is that? Okay. What were you gathering for in the first place then? Is there any, is there any um, mandate from scripture for us to worship? We need to have an answer for that question. Once you tell people that it is not vital, it's not commanded, it's not necessary to have a public gathering, to have a corporate gathering. My question is, well, why then are you going to at some point plan to tell them come back? Yeah. And how are you going to convince them that what you said when you said it's not necessary, it's not vital, it's not commanded, when you said that, how can you walk that back? Yeah. And it's kind of like sometimes I think when when you buy something on Amazon and you take it all out of the box and and then you want to put it back in because you need to send it back. Something was broken. Yeah. And it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You cannot figure out how to get it back in the box yeah. the same way that you took it out of the box. And I think this moment is going yeah. to be like that for some churches. Yeah. I think we are unnecessarily convincing some people that they never need to come yeah. back. I've seen a lot of churches start to make the argument 
that public worship isn't even necessary. I, yeah. I saw an article this week of a church talking about how um, they think a viable alternative indefinitely is an online campus for their church mm-hmm. and that they're just going to view that as as a legitimate thing that people can stay in indefinitely. That yeah. That's okay. And, and the funny thing about where we are is we kind of have friends on every end of the spectrum. True. And that's kind of all, always been the strange <laughs> right. niche that, that we're in where we have learned so much from some guys that are super reformed, very traditional yep. uh, churches is not going to grow numerically. But then we've also learned a great deal from very pragmatic, mm-hmm. seeker sensitive guys who are forming large churches. And when we talk about this, understand we have relationships with people on all ends. Yep. And so when we talk about this and we answer the question, because one of the questions I want to talk about today is, is online church okay. just as good as an in-person physical corporate gathering? We're not trying to attack anyone. Yeah. We're not trying to to vilify or demean anyone or say people are stupid or you know just awful in any way. We actually just for our benefit want to answer this mm-hmm. specifically for the people of Village Church, but also uh, one role that I want to have for people is help other pastors to really think through what we're doing, because there seems to be an attitude going on, uh, really in networks, uh, denominations even, that once a figurehead has made a decision, once someone that has a public Mm. profile or his church is bigger than yours or his influence is bigger than yours, once he has made a decision for his church, no one is really allowed to question that. No one is right. allowed to speak into that right. because your opinion is not as important. And I just I just reject that idea because everyone needs to be held accountable. And once you get to a place where you just have to approve of every decision a figurehead makes or every decision a denomination head makes or every decision a network head makes, once you get to a place where you just have to approve of it all, then what are we doing? Yeah. Because that, that, that means that person has no accountability. And everyone can make a bad a bad decision, rather. Yeah. Everyone is flawed in one way, shape, or form. And one of the beautiful things that we bring into our lives by having a network of churches or having a convention or a denomination is that you have a plurality of perspectives. And I think it is important for the voices that maybe think a different direction is at least, at minimum, more healthy than that. Those voices need to be heard throughout the world rather than just saying, well, you're just being divisive. Yeah. Well, you know, if you if you call the, the president of your convention out and say he's wrong, you're being divisive. That historically speaking, that never ends well. Yeah, uh, that, that that just ends with with someone surrounded by yes men. And I think it's important to understand that in love, you have the opportunity to speak into people's lives who have more influence than you have, <coughs> excuse me, whose opinions are counted on a little more than yours. And I think, at least for the local church perspective, kind of like we talked about last week, I think the most important voice in anyone's life where theology and scripture is concerned is the voice of the pastors in a local church. And so what someone is deciding in another state, it's very audacious and arrogant to assume that that must be the decision that everyone needs to go with. Uh, because I just don't always think that that is healthy, and I don't always think that they are right. Yeah. And so when we talk about things like online church, that is especially trending right now. Um, I know that uh, one idea, because when we first kind of separated where COVID is concerned and kind of physically distanced from one another, we were doing our services online. Uh, we were having Zoom groups, and I, I'd thrown around the idea even in my own head. Well, maybe when when you know fall comes and we resume groups, maybe we need to continue to have a couple of Zoom groups and and launch some Zoom groups with Zoom leaders and and do all do all this Zoom stuff. And as time has gone on, I, I've kind of pulled back from that because the question that we have to ask is not is this going to work, right. not are people going to use this. But is this the healthiest way for someone yeah. to grow in their discipleship? And I mean that in a lot of ways. When, yeah. you're, when you're talking about someone who is going to physically distance from relationships for the long haul, we're talking about at some point, some people are going to physically distance and not do physical relationships for a year yeah. when all is said and done, maybe longer. Right now, we're looking at six months. And we have to ask the question, based on everything that we know, is that healthy? Same thing with the online church. 
Online services can be a great supplement to corporate worship, whether it is because you are ill, whether it is because a pandemic truly is sure. going on, whether you're out of town, you know, any number of reasons that you might be unable to gather. Yeah. Is that healthy where a supplement is concerned? Absolutely. It is a great tool that we've been able to use to reach far more people, even in this medium, sure. than we would otherwise reach. But the question must be asked, is it the best? Yeah. Is it the healthiest? And I think we have to say no. Yeah. I mean, are we asking the theological question? That's what I really want to know yeah, from, yeah. from churches making these decisions is, okay, I realize what we can do. Isn't that article I read talking about how, you know, maybe this has shown us we can have an online-only presence for, uh -huh. for people, and that's just going to reach people who would, would never come to church. Yeah. And so we're, we're asking the question, what can we do, not what should we do, not, as mm -hmm. you said, what is going to help their discipleship. So a couple other things. I've seen come up that questions that have been raised is one, um, the question of, okay, is the church not just what happens in a building, but is the church what happens outside the walls of a building? Yeah. And of course the church is bigger than just what happens in a service. But for some reason in asking that question, we seem to be demeaning the service. So we want to talk about that. Then I've seen a lot of talk about, you know, are, is the house church model actually the most authentic model for the church? Yeah. So that's another, I just want to kind of and lay out some of the angles. What's we fascinating want to talk about, about that about. specific question is, is a lot of people think that that's just something new. Someone noticed. I know that before we planted, <laughs> right? that was like the hottest item. Yeah where a lot of church planters were convinced that the only way to, to plant yeah. a healthy church was to make them house churches. Yeah. And so that is not something new, yeah. but it's also something that a lot of people aren't talking about anymore. Yes, yeah, so we need to ask theological questions yeah. about that. Not just do house churches work, but what's the theological reason behind that? So setting this up for this conversation here, I think there's there's three big areas to talk about when it comes to how the church gathers and should the church gather. Mm -hmm. um, one area that I think is most important is theology. What's the theological reason for the ch corporate worship service <coughs> of the church gathering publicly? Uh, then I do think it's important to talk about the history. You know, what was the early church uh, house churches? Did the early church have corporate gatherings kind of like we see now? We need to talk about that because it's not like we don't know. And I think yeah. that's uh, I see a lot of pseudo history going on yeah. around that. And then the third yeah. thing is just pragmatically. Like mm -hmm. pragmatic, and this is a question that I am very curious to see some of the larger churches that I have respected for how they do their corporate worship in a, in a very professional way that, that seems to reach a lot of people. Well, pragmatically, if that was good for, for advancing and furthering the mission of Jesus, what does that say then about pragmatically how we're approaching the worship service now if it's not important? Like, yeah. does the worship service actually serve a purpose for the church? I think, of course, it does. Um, and we'll, we'll learn that from the theology, but there's a lot of pragmatics in a good way to talk about as far as that goes. Yeah. And so let's, let's just start talking okay. about the, yeah. the kind of the theological reasons that the church must gather. And right. I think the first thing to point out is just in the New Testament, the term that we have translated as church, and I think that's vital for people yes. to understand, is that when you hear people say, well, you know, the word church is, isn't even in, you know, in the scriptures as a non-biblical word. Well, right, because they didn't speak English. Yeah. <laughs> we have translated the term ecclesia as church. What does that term mean? In its most honest definition, it means assembly. And that's a good, a good place to start, yes. is that to have an assembly, what must you do? You must assemble. That's correct. If you don't assemble, you are no longer in assembly. Yeah. And the way that it's used in the Bible, um, you know, first by Jesus and then, and then on and on, is it is a called out right. assembly. So it is a people that are called out of the world in order to assemble for a specific reason. And so the church of Jesus Christ is that assembly. The church of Jesus Christ is that vision. We have been called out by God through the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we've been called to gather with one another for the purposes that Jesus meant for us to live. And, you know, there's a, there are a couple of different um, kind of reasons that we do assemble. First, okay. we assemble for the worship of God. Yeah. Uh, you know, Hebrews 10, 25, you know, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. There's a reason that we assemble with one another, and that is to worship God together. Then secondly, it's for Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 tells us it is for the edification of the saints. We are building each other up. We are pushing each other to go to mature manhood. We are equipping the saints for the work of ministry so that everybody 
when can be joined together to build themselves up in love so that they can become more like Jesus Christ. And then finally, of course, Acts 1.8, the proclamation of the gospel. Yeah. We are together witnessing to what Jesus has done as one assembled body. Um, you know, 1 Corinthians 14, 24 through 25 says this, when an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. <clears throat> this is a fascinating yeah. text because it says basically that when you assemble, right. There are people that don't believe the gospel, that have never heard the gospel, maybe, yeah. that are going to enter into your assembly, and you need to be cognizant of that fact. Yeah. So that lets us know right. that in the early church, we're talking about 1 Corinthians, probably written 55 AD. Right. We're talking about a church that is publicly gathered to the yeah. to the point where the unbelievers in the community know where to go, know when to go there, know what they're going to do, and they're going to come and hear the gospel. Yeah. <clears throat> and we have to assemble in light of that. Yeah. I mean, that verse really just, it just nails a theology of you know, public worship against online worship. Cause how is, if you're worshiping online in your living room, and I really do think this is a thing that personally we should ask ourselves if, if just sitting on our couch, which is admittedly comfortable, <laughs> sipping mm. our coffee, which is admittedly comfortable, mm. you know, pulling up YouTube on the TV and watching, watching an online worship service. How is First Corinthians 14, where an unbeliever observes that and just sees the glory of God on display with God's people worshiping him. And then just a beautiful language falls on his face and just realizes his need for salvation. I mean, that's the mission right there. Right. How's that ever going to happen when we're separated in online worship? And think about it in multiple ways. One, of course, how is that going to see people reached with the gospel? But two, how is the person who is a believer sitting on their couch watching the service, how are they going to experience, you know, participating with God in the mission right. of his work in the world? Right. It, it's not going to happen. And so I'm interested in that idea of the, the theology of public worship. Yeah. So that's the, I think 1 Corinthians 14 is maybe the most in your face example of that. But even backing all the way up to just the idea of the church is to worship God. Mm -hmm. And so some people might ask, and so this would be a question, like, can't I worship God by myself? What's the difference between worshiping God by myself and worshiping God with a group of assembled believers? Well, the, the whole reality there is that you individually are not the church. Hmm. You are not the body of Christ. Yeah. The vision that the scriptures give us of the body of Christ is we are members one of another. We are one in Christ. We are one in the spirit. And when we come together together, we are then the body of Christ. So individually, you don't express what the work of the gospel is doing. When you break the gospel down to the fact of this is reconciliation with God, the New Testament spells out multiple times, especially in places like Ephesians 2, 2 Corinthians 5, that once you are reconciled with God, it then gives you the gift to reconcile with other people. And one beautiful thing that the corporate gathering of the church represents is people who are coming together for the specific purpose that they have been reconciled to God. And through that reconciliation, they are being reconciled with one another. And the gathering of the church expresses that in a way that nothing else really can possibly express that on this earth. Yeah. Yeah. Just the vision of, and you take this, if we could follow this through the Old yeah. Testament and in Israel and, and ways they were commanded to worship. But I mean, of course it is true that, and, and we get this from even texts like Romans 12, that our, our whole lives should be spiritual acts of worship, right? So, well, yeah, But if you bring but, up Romans 12, it <laughs> right. says, you know, you're, you lay your body on the altar is basically right. the picture. And then it immediately goes into, yes. now that you've done the spiritual yeah. act of sacrifice, you are members one of another. Yeah, right. So so no one's denying that, that we can and should worship God in every area of life. We teach that all the time at Village Church. But there is something very specific about the assembled gathering of God's people and and the worship that happens there is not something you can do outside of that because mm -hmm. it's something that happens as we together are becoming the church and displaying to the world who the church is we can't display to the world who the church is when you're by yourself right i remember man i think i was 19 years old 
and I was in a shopping center uh, with with a bunch of other students, and we were we were there specifically to to witness to people to evangelize. And I went into a laundromat, and I was, I you know, I was probably awful at it at this point, but I you know I gave this woman you know like a four spiritual laws card, something like that, and uh, you know I asked her, uh, you know, are, are you a Christian? She was like, absolutely. And then I, I made what I thought then was a huge error. I asked her what church she was a part of. And her response immediately was, oh, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And I was disarmed at that point because I was not prepared uh, to have that theological mm-hmm. discussion with her. If I could go back to that moment, yeah. I would have t- completely disagreed with her uh, and said, yes, actually, you do have to be a part of a church to be a Christian. And I think this is where people really misunderstand what the implications of the gospel on your mm-hmm. life are is that, you know, it's that that old saying, faith that saves is alone or faith <laughs> saves alone, but a faith that saves is never alone. Right. Something to that, yep. that idea. But, uh, you know, the fact is that part of when faith saving you, changing your life, regenerating you is that it brings you in and makes you a part of the body of Christ. That is not optional. You do not have the freedom in Christ to disobey commands. You don't have that freedom. And I think a lot of us, we like to look in for things that we're trying to get an out on and say, oh, so you're a legalist. Oh, so you think I have to do something in order to be saved. No, that's, a, that's what's called a category error in theology. Yeah. You absolutely have to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ to be a Christian. Because Ephesians chapter 1 clearly says that Jesus is the head of the church, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Jesus has looked at the church of Jesus Christ, has looked at his body and said, this is where I find my fullness. And so when you try to divorce yourself away from the church of Jesus Christ, you necessarily are saying, well, I'm going to divorce myself away from Jesus. You can't follow Jesus and try to have a plan of your own that's completely apart from him. That is a implication of the gospel that is unavoidable. And so if you truly do have faith in Jesus Christ, one of the necessary fruits of that salvation is your involvement with a locally gathered assembly. You have to fall under the authority of the church. Hmm. Let's talk about just, I think it would be helpful just to go through, um, and we'll talk as we go, but just some of the many reasons why, again, we're kind of hammering on this point, but I think it's important, why public gathered worship is important. Well, ironically, we have a list <laughs> of five things from nine more that ministries. you said ironically. Yeah. And, and what, what's interesting about this is, is that, you know, when John MacArthur had decided to defy the tyranny of, of the governor and the mayor, uh, nine marks were the first people to come out and say, well, you know, slow down. Let's not act like every church needs to start gathering again, because a lot of the nine marks churches aren't, aren't gathering yet uh, for one reason or another. And so they have tried to to play the foil to the idea that we need to come back together on Sunday morning yeah. services to to kind of state that we have a, a pastoral freedom to make whatever decision we want to. And in one in one view, you know, don't hear what I'm not saying. Yeah. In one view, I understand what they're trying to do. Yeah. But in another side, it perpetuates this idea yeah. that there's a freedom to yeah. disobey God. That right. because you're a Christian, you have a freedom to ignore the clear commands of Scripture. Yeah. You do not. Right. Here's what I want to ask to nine marks. <laughs> and the, the running joke now is that, that perhaps they need a tenth mark of yeah. we should actually gather. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it's a serious question. Is it, We're about to read what I think is an excellent list from nine marks of all the reasons why um, the church must gather publicly and corporately. And the question that I want to ask to them in any church that is still not meeting is, um, what about these reasons is not important enough to justify meeting at these time at this right. time. Like if, if these are our theological reasons. So while it is true in theory that every uh, pastoral team must make the decision for their church when they should meet, that doesn't give us license to not have to answer the question, well, why don't these reasons mean we should meet? Because otherwise then some churches can just not meet ever again right. if the pastoral team decides that's true. And at some point, and you kind of alluded to this at our introduction, at some point, the the evangelical conservative Christian church as a whole 
can ask the question of each other, which is what we're doing when we do this. Those are our friends. Yeah. Those are people who I think are on our team, so to speak, in the, the greater evangelical church world. And we need to be able to ask the question, okay, I, I understand you're making this decision for your church, but why? Theologically, mm-hmm. why? And so that's what we're going to do here. Yeah, right. So let's, let's start looking through this list, okay? So what does the New Testament teach us about the local church assembly? First, we see that churches in the New Testament gathered regularly. Paul uses phrases like when you come together as a church and the whole church comes together. There's a whole yeah. monologue from 1 Corinthians 11 through 1 yeah. Corinthians 14 where Paul deals with what it looks like when they come yeah. together wrongly and then what it needs to look like for them to come together rightly. And there's a big presupposition that Paul has right. that they're coming together. Right. Just the language of the epistles. And it's scattered throughout is a picture of Paul addressing the church when they assemble. That's why we made a point of that at the beginning, when they gather. And there's no if no, in that no, statement. No there's if. no if. It's just when. Now, yeah. again, don't hear what we're not saying. There are always going to be people on the margins who are unable to gather, right. whether it is because of their health, yeah. whether it is because of some situation yes. that's out of their control. But let's be clear. Yeah. That's the margin. Right. That's, that's not the norm. And what we're doing right now is, is we are making people who are on the margins and saying yeah. that that's becoming the norm. That's the exception that proves the rule. And folks who genuinely, for medical reasons, who can't gather, I think they would be some of the first ones to say, you who can should. Right. You who can must. Like, um, don't don't use what is a, a burden in my life that, that I need God's grace and strength and help from the church. Right. Don't use that as an excuse for you not to do what God has given you the grace to be able to do. Mm-hmm. I guarantee you they would say that. Right. Now, secondly, a church assembly is a distinct event. This is is evident because Paul provides specific instructions on what believers should do, quote unquote, in church. Mm -hmm. That is the church meeting. In church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 19. And then he goes on in verse 28 to say, if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church. So there's that amazing phrase that he uses twice there. Mm -hmm. In the assembly. So there's this idea that they are all gathered at one time together as a church. It is a distinct event at a distinct time where they all come together. Yeah. Now, reading passages like that, why can't that just be two or three people at a coffee shop? Like, Because, well, it can be in some distinct situations. Like if you are in an area where that is literally... All of the followers of Jesus that happen to be together in a community, in a village, in a town, under, you know, let's say we're in kind of pioneer missionary work, and and he's led these people to Christ. He is their pastor, discipling each of them, and the church is the size of that small group. But here's the thing that always happens in the New Testament. The New Testament norm is that a small church rarely stays a small church. Right. Now, there's no size that it multiplies to, but multiplication is the biblical ideal that we see in the book of Acts. How on earth do we think the church spread from this group of 120 disciples to, um, in just a couple hundred years, being the dominant force in the Western world, um, and the churches stayed small? Yeah, we we know, and we'll we'll get to this in a bit, but we know just from Acts that very quickly there were thousands of now, believers. But what I just gave you is the missionary move of pioneer missionary right. work in villages of people who are unreached, right. who have just been engaged with the gospel. But what's happening right, right now is, and what's important to say is, you and your friends canoeing. Donald Miller in his book, you yeah. know, Blue Like Jazz, yeah. he had this 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 vision yeah. of the church where it was just him and his friends would go out kayaking on a Sunday morning, yeah. and they had church. Yeah, That is not the church. That is not a church assembly. Right. You and your buddies doing coffee together, getting together in houses, you aren't the church right. because the New Testament also gives us a distinction of the church that it has to be gathered under um, qualified leadership. Right. So the question then has to become who qualifies them? Yeah. You don't qualify yourself. You have to be approved. Paul had to approve of Timothy and he told Timothy that you need to appoint elders in every town. Right. You don't have the authority to ordain yourself as a pastor. Right. 
So getting back to the, these these texts, what we're seeing is this example of Paul talking about people. When you do this, when you're in church, when the church comes together, and we don't have a vision at all of just a couple people here and a couple people there. We have a vision of of all the believers in this area who are under qualified authority of, of pastor elders coming together to have church assemblies. That's yeah. the vision that Paul's uh, yeah. writing gives. And, and I've seen so many people that think that them and three of their buddies or them and one other family, they're 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 going to get all of the impurity out of the church. They're going to become the the pure, quote unquote, <laughs> pure church. That never ends well. No. Never ends well. All right, number three. Yep. Even large churches met as one body in the New Testament era. Thousands of believers belonged to the congregation at Jerusalem, yet they met all together in Solomon's portico, Acts 5, 12 tells us. So yep. in the book of Acts, we're five chapters into right. Acts. Very early. And we're looking at what could have very well been. Now, yes, they did meet from house to house, but they had larger mm-hmm. assemblies, according to Acts yeah. chapter 5, in the temple, yeah. in Solomon's portico. And so that's a vital yeah. thing to understand is you're dealing with at least hundreds, possibly thousands of people gathering at Solomon's portico. Yeah, we'll get to some of that when we get to the history part. But theologically, there is reason in the New Testament to understand that these were some pretty big gatherings at some Absolutely. point. Absolutely. The vision that the New Testament church, that the earliest Christians, it was just groupings of 12 to 20 people is immature. Yeah. It means you don't understand how to look at context. It means you don't understand yeah. history. And it's just not true. Right. It's just, it is untrue. Fourth, the New Testament writers instruct churches to do activities that can only be done by meeting together. First, teaching and admonishing one another, singing hymns, psalms, and spiritual songs, reading scripture publicly, encouraging one another, sharing the Lord's Supper. None of these can happen in a vacuum. And while it's true that many of these things can take place among smaller subsets of the church, such as your Tuesday night community group, we should assume that they belong first and foremost to the main congregational gathering, given the biblical emphasis on the whole church coming together. Yeah, all throughout Paul's epistles, and this is a a theme, not just all the New Testament epistles, there is this assumption that the church is having time enough together to care for each other in multiple various ways, ways that simply can't happen um, online or can't happen even in just very segregated smaller groups that don't make up the whole church. Right, right. And it's many of the reasons that people will default to that quite often is because they can't get along with other people. Yeah. Um, they they have either seen something bad happen in church, experienced something bad happen in church, and the weight of, of personal experience yeah. is forcing them to see the scriptures through yeah. something that they're going through that has been a negative experience in their yeah. lives. You don't have the freedom to do that. I've right. had terrible experiences <laughs> right. uh, in church ministry. I've been in church ministry pretty much my entire life. I've seen things... Uh, as bad as you can see them, I've been treated in ways that are as bad as you can be treated. And I've seen sin about as bad as you can see it from many yeah. different pastors. And here's the key. My experience doesn't overrule the teaching of Scripture. Yeah. Doesn't overrule the way that it was done in the New Testament. Yeah. And so you might even look at some of these ways that the that New Testament commands believers to serve one another and care for one another and equip one another and think, mm-hmm. well, a lot of that happens through community groups, say, in our right. context. But what you're missing is how are the community groups organized? Right. Community groups are organized from the church assembly as a whole. If you try to just have rogue community groups that are just doing their own thing, I can promise you real quick that goes bad and these kind of things don't happen. You, you need, and this is where I alluded to earlier, you need qualified leadership. You need the preaching of the word, things that will We'll, yeah. we'll get to. And, you know, as a caveat, a community group can become a church. Right. Here's the key. Again, you do not have the authority to make that decision. Yeah. You must fall under qualified leadership. Yeah. You must go to your pastor. You must become equipped, qualified, and approved of in order to become a pastor of a church. And so if your community group and you're looking at it and you're like, man, this would be a great church plant. You need to go to your pastors right. and get their feedback on that to ensure that you're doing it the biblical way. But if your pastors do approve, pretty quickly, my experience has been, if it's a truly qualified leader, 
It's going to outgrow the ability to yeah. meet in your home pretty quick. Right. Yep. Yeah. Fifth, church discipline is an act of the gathered congregation. Jesus envisions the church as a whole, the ecclesia, speaking to the unrepentant sinner. In order to do this, they must be gathered in his name, Matthew 18 tells us. Paul echoes this language as he instructs the Corinthians to implement church discipline. He says um, um, in uh, in Paul's writings, he says, when you are assembled, it's the same word as gathered in Matthew 18, 20, in the name of the Lord Jesus in 1 Corinthians 5. And they're about to do some church discipline on this person. And yeah. so church discipline has this idea that it comes to a point, not at the beginning yeah. of church discipline, but eventually, if there's no repentance taking right. place for the good of your church and for the good of that person, there has to be a public acknowledgement of yeah. the sin. The church is, and it's something we don't talk about enough or in um, enough ways to be helpful, but the church is defined by its discipline, by its fencing of who is the church. That is part of the reason why we have the organized church is to say who is a Christian, right? Mm-hmm. And and so that uh, needs to be another podcast topic at some time because I think that would be helpful. Absolutely. But here's the thing. Um, you can't do that in an online only church or you can't even do that in it would be difficult to do that in a very scattered network of churches that don't really have a, a public corporate worship gathering because at the public corporate worship gathering, that is where you see the church assembled. Go back, going back to that key word, yeah. the church assembles and you know, these are the people saying they're a part of our church. And then the pastor elders of the church have a responsibility to ensure that those people who are there are living lives as Christians. That is right. part of role and responsibility of the church. And you can't do that if you never see people and don't know who they are, Correct. don't know how they're living their lives, don't know um, how they are displaying the fruits of salvation, which are also displayed in the church gathered together. Yeah. If you are a normal, everyday guy or gal, um, normal family with none of the marginal reasons for not gathering, uh, lack of health, um, you know, you know, whatever yeah, have you, whatever, sure. whatever the obstacles are for someone. And right. I, I, there's no way I could give an exhaustive list because yeah. I know somebody's going to think of something I right. haven't thought of. But if you don't have any of those qualifications and you just say, well, you know, I'm, I'm more comfortable in my home. I, it fits my time better yeah. on and on and on. You cannot say you're just going to do online church. You just don't have that authority. And the New Testament does not give us yeah. a qualification for that. It does not say you have the right to not gather. You have the right to not be known. You have no. the right to live a life in which you are impervious to yeah. church discipline. You can't do that. But here's the key. It's for your health. Right. It's for your good. Yes. Online church cannot meet yeah. the standard of the theological vision that the New Testament gives us. Yeah. And to kind of repeat something you said earlier we are in no way against having a quality online presence there's value Absolutely. in that i think it it is in many ways in our culture the church's front door but it's just that it's the front door yeah. that's all but and then we need to i think i do think there is increasingly a need to to say that's all it is too it's got to just be a, a good right. front door it can't be it's, it's a supplement anything after that. It, it is not the main course yeah it is a supplement uh, you know, we, we've been since the 1950s embracing technology for good yeah. to further the name of Jesus, to witness to the power of the gospel to people through radio, through television. And now as technology goes on and on to computer, to tablet, to phone, uh, you know, through Facebook, through YouTube, through podcasts, through all this stuff, we are able to proclaim the gospel to more and more people all yeah. of the time. But we have to understand that once a person comes to faith, we have to be clear, the most important thing that they can do for their discipleship is to physically connect to a local church. Yeah, absolutely. That's the theological framework. Yeah. Now, before we go on, I want to pause. Okay. I think that's a good stopping point uh, to, to stop this episode, and we're going to pick back up in two weeks, and we're going to continue this conversation, and we're going to have a part two of Must the Church Gather? Thank you. Thank you.